Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Stephanie Nadolny. Stephanie is the Vice President of Hospital Operations for the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, Cape Cod, and the Vice President of Ancillary Services, Spalding Rehabilitation Network. Stephanie started her career in therapeutic recreation and has worked in rehabilitation services for nearly 30 years. In this podcast, we talk about Stephanie's journey from an entry-level clinician to her running a 60-bed rehabilitation hospital and helping to lead a rehabilitation services network. I really enjoyed talking with Stephanie, not just because she happens to be a two-time University of New Hampshire alumna, but also because she's a truly authentic leader. I hope you enjoy listening to her journey as much as I did. And if you do enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Stephanie Nadolny. So welcome to the podcast, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. So I really always enjoy having UNH alumni on, and you are an alumna of both the Department of Recreation Management and Policy with a bachelor's degree in therapeutic recreation, and of my department, Health Management and Policy, with a master's of healthcare administration. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of take you way back and and start by asking you, uh, what drew you to UNH as an undergrad, and specifically what brought you into rec therapy? Sure. Well, it was funny. I had actually made my college decision and chosen a different university. And a friend of mine, I had been accepted to UNH, and a friend said, oh, well, let's just go up for the tour. The minute I walked on campus, I'm sure it happens to many people, I was like, "Uh uh-oh, this is my home. This is where I need to be. And when I I just loved everything about it and and instantly felt part of a new community. I was a very joining kind of person, student government, sorority, everything that you could get involved in at UNH. I loved it. But I started off as a medical technology major, which means I would have gone to work in a lab. And pretty quickly, first semester freshman year, I said, me in a lab? I mean, I'm definitely an extrovert. I definitely love science, but knew that that was not the right field for me. And I had worked for many years at a school for children with disabilities and started to think, well, maybe it's OT or PT, or I'm not sure what it's going to be. And I did some exploration and ended up feeling that therapeutic recreation was really the fit for me because I think it played to my strengths, but I had a real passion for seeing people rejoin their lives in whole. Whereas I think, you know, PT and OT kind of focus on specific aspects of a person's life where TR really says, okay, now that we have you walking and talking and eating, what are you going to do with that? You know, you've had a stroke, but you can still go fishing or skiing or read with your grandchildren or whatever it might be. And that really was something I felt very passionate about. And it was quite an easy transition from med tech into TR at UNH. So sophomore year I made the change or I think halfway through freshman year I made the change. That's cool. So I mean that is a uh, I'll be honest I mean I worked in healthcare for 20 plus years and I didn't know about TR until I I got here and I kind of met some of my colleagues and they started telling me about it and I, I just think it's the it's a really cool and I think maybe not as well known field. Right. I feel that it's having a bit of a uh, it, it's beginning to gather some steam lately. It started way back in the VA hospitals where, of course, you know, soldiers would come home from war with injuries and there was this little niche that helped them, you know, fulfill some of their uh, leisure interests. But now with sort of adaptive sports and the Paralympics and all of those things, you know, and, and advocacy for the rights of the disabled has really opened up a whole new world. And I, I think TR is going to grow, which is exciting because it had kind of stagnated a little bit in the middle because it is not a reimbursed service like PT and OT. So I think it struggled for a bit. And, you know, the adaptive sports, it's part of Spalding, which we'll get to later, has a very vibrant adaptive sports program, all staffed with therapeutic rec, which is really exciting. Oh, wow. Okay. So they actually use that. It's not just somebody who knows the sport or correct. It's oh, a trained therapeutic rec. Yeah. Neat. So, I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned it's a different from physical therapy and occupational therapy because it's kind of looking at what you're going to do after. Mm-hmm. 
but you had, uh, I mean, we're going to talk about this, but you had a lot of time on the inpatient side. Mm -hmm. So I found one of the things like I learned from Jill Gravink, who've mm -hmm. had, had on, she's the executive director of Northeast Passage. And she graduated uh, so, either right before me or right after me. I knew Jill at UNH. Is that, oh, yeah. you knew Jill. Okay, great. Yeah, fabulous person. Um, great program. But, you know, I learned from her talking about like, and you, maybe you can expand on this, like therapeutic recreation uses recreational activities to not just to kind of give you a something to do, but also to teach you a lot of things you now need to learn how to do maybe after a... Mm -hmm after some sort of accident, or maybe you could expand a little bit sure, on that. Absolutely. I, I think one of the beauties of it is that it does partner with OT and PT to, let me give a very concrete example. You know, you have someone who has a brain injury and they want to be able to go back to work. Well, they need to learn how to use public transportation and get around in the world and talk to people in public settings, ask for help, all of those things. And you can do it through teaching with OT or PT, or you can do it through something fun, like we're going out to the movies and you're going to figure out how we're going to get there and how we're going to pay. And then guess what? We're going to really enjoy the movie too. So, you know, it's kind of giving real life situations as a person recovers from an injury or an illness and across all the disciplines. That's the best part of it. It's a very team-oriented role that only works well when it's working with the other disciplines. Yeah, it, it sounds like it, it, it is a neat area that I think, uh, what are your thoughts on, you mentioned that it's not a, typically a reimbursed mm -hmm. service. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on going forward? How will that play with health reform? I, I think some of it has already played out. So when I started at Spalding, um, you know, back in 1989 as a fairly new grad, we had a department of 10 people. We had people assigned to every unit in the hospital. There were, I, I actually worked on the addictions unit, which was really super interesting. And I worked in oncology and other people worked in stroke. And as the reimbursement world has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter, that department was effectively disbanded other than one or two people who worked mostly in spinal cord and head injury which was felt to be the most profound impact on people's lives. They kept the service in those departments. And over the years, Spalding has rebuilt the department a little bit, but never to the level it was because there isn't really a great funding source. You know, in rehab, we barely break even. It's very different than the acute care hospitals where there's some margin. We really don't have much of one. And it's, it's hard to justify sometimes the departments that are really overhead. And I hate to use that word because it's so much more meaningful than uh, overhead, but it's a struggle. So that's why I think the branching off into things like adaptive sports and community-based activities for people who have disabilities is a different kind of way to go because those can be funded through grants and through people paying for it themselves. You know, we run kayaking programs, for instance, and it costs $10. So it's affordable, yet if you get enough people there, it covers the cost of running the program. So it really has unfortunately changed quite a bit over the years. I mean, it strikes me that as we move towards more of an ACO model where we're going to have, where we have a coordinating organization, you know, an ACO, accountable care organization that is getting reimbursed at least in part for kind of reducing the amount of care that they used at services like therapeutic recreation that can maybe reduce readmissions or reduce utilization of more traditional services might start to, you might be able to start to make a business case that historically we haven't been able to make. Right. And I think there's some research that proves that I'm a little removed from active TR at this point, but um, I know over the years there has been substantial, substantial research showing that the benefit of, you know, not just TR, but other integrative kind of modalities that really provide overall wellness, which reduces hospitalizations, which reduces healthcare costs, you know, all of that. So I'm not sure who's on the forefront making those arguments now, but I hope they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I don't want to push you in, in uh, too much in an area that I just, I just find the, uh, the, the field really fascinating. I, I have a love and passion for it still. I did adaptive cycling yeah. Wednesday. I was out there. <laughs> oh, very my cool. My friend who's blind, riding a bike, having a blast. So it's dear to my oh. heart. <laughs> yeah. So you graduated with your degree in therapeutic recreation, and you got a job right away out of school. And we were talking, this is, was more of a transitional experience, but you got a job right out of school 
with uh, Crystal Springs School in Massachusetts mm -hmm. as a therapeutic recreation specialist. What was it like um, uh, uh, working in the school environment? Yeah, I, I wrote down, it's funny in my notes, a little dysfunctional. So I was very <laughs> used to a healthcare model and to go into a uh -huh. vocational model, it was a school for very severe and profoundly develop, developmentally disabled um, children and young adults. And um, it was a, a very big mind shift for me where you know, we were so focused on goals and moving forward and getting people better and seeing miracles happen. And here it was more about how to ensure that these children and young adults were thriving as best they could, but there really weren't gains to be made. And I found that really hard personally. And I found the educational model hard. I thought healthcare had a lot of paperwork. Education sure has a lot of paperwork. So it was a great year, a great learning experience. But as soon as the job opened, it's falling, I jump ship. <laughs> Did you? Okay. And and you had told me earlier, you actually did a internship with Spalding uh -huh. while you were in school. I did. Oh. Yes, I did. That was the kind of the, the entree into yeah. the healthcare, I mean, healthcare side. Was where I wanted to be. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you um, joined the Spalding Rehab Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston mm -hmm. uh, as a senior therapist in, in back in 1989. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we're going to talk more about Spalding, uh, uh, but kind of briefly, what was this organization that you joined? Sure. So, you know, Spalding is pretty renowned rehabilitation hospital located in Boston. So structured around different programs based on the diagnosis that the person comes in with. So, you know, different units kind of already mentioned, but for stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, complications following surgeries, part of a Harvard Medical School residency teaching program for physiatry, so physical medicine and rehab, which I love. So there's a lot of research that has always been generated out of Spalding. And despite not actively participating, and I love that new learning and hearing about the things that are happening in the rehab world. And I also found that as a rec therapist, super respected and part of the team, which was very important that, you know, we were valued, not seen as the people for when the patients are bored, but seen as part of getting this person well again. So I loved it. I loved being a therapist there. And that was where I had my first encounter with someone who saw potential in me. I, I kind of always knew that I'd end up in management of some kind. I, I kind of, um, one of those little bit type A, super organized, like to plan, like to lead and direct. So my boss at the time also was right from the get-go, very supportive of me and, and my goals and where I would go next. So it was a, a great fit on a lot of reasons, clinically and you know professionally as well. So did you come in immediately as a supervisor or was were, that something you moved into? Uh, you no, know, moved time? into supervisor role. Started as a senior therapist, but moved into a supervisory role within a year or two, okay. I know. It's back in the 80s, I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. So, I mean, this is a, I mean, a, a lot of, uh, of students listen to this podcast, yeah. so, I, so I take people back, you know. Right. Um, no, I but I'm it. curious. Yeah, we weren't born yet, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, right? So, during that time, you know, you, you became a supervisor. What was that like? Do you remember what was that like making that transition for you? I do. I, I remember, I think. I think about it now a lot because I see many of our younger clinicians beginning to take on supervisory roles and I'm really able to look back on how I've changed and how that first supervisory role is really, um, I guess it's when you find your legs and I, I think about how I'm very different now. I think back then, you know, maybe a little nervous and to have to supervise people that had been my peers, but now I was kind of their boss and finding that very difficult and awkward at times. And then also, I, I think I see this a lot with new supervisors. You kind of go by the book, you know, you follow the policies and maybe you're a little bit of a hard nosed about things because you haven't really developed that comfort with your own leadership. So you're making decisions that are probably a little too inflexible sometimes and a little too harsh. And it, it goes against my nature. I'm not that kind of person. So I, I did find out of the gate, I was like that. And over the years I've softened, but I watch new supervisors do the same thing because I think it's about comfort and sort of what you know and trying to be kind of black and white and be fair. But at the same time, you're being kind of inflexible and not really taking into account the many variables that might be in a situation. So do you, is that a, maybe a mistake you see young supervisors 
kind of making? I don't uh, know if I'd call it a mistake or it's just part of the learning curve, as long as they have someone who can help guide them around that, you know, as long yeah. as I had a great boss who really was a mentor, which we'll talk about in a little while probably, yeah. but, you know, she was able to say to me, you know, you don't really need to be that strict about that. Let's talk about, <laughs> you know, what's reasonable, you know, what's a reasonable accommodation to make for someone who can't get to work on time. There's probably a reason. Can we try to work that out? And I'd be like, no, if they're not here at 8 a.m., they're late. Well, no, not really. So let's, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I try to do the same and I try to encourage the managers who report to me to do that with their new supervisors. And now we have so much supervisory training. I don't remember having any of that back in the day. And now like here at Spalding, we provide a lot of training to our supervisors so that they have more opportunity to grow. Well, you pursued a, the MHA I mentioned earlier during this phase of your career. Yeah. So Master's of Healthcare Administration, you came back up here to UNH to do that. What drew you to the MHA? Sure. Why not they say MBA or and why UNH's program? I, I explored a few different things. I actually went to um, Northeastern briefly, starting to take classes towards maybe MBA. They had a master's in rehab management. They had these interesting programs. But I found it so stressful trying to leave work, hop on the T, get over to Northeastern. I was like, oh, I was always running ragged. And I am a strong believer in the whole work-life balance. This was before I had children, but I was trying to juggle it all and I found it unmanageable. And that's when I learned about, you know, UNH's program at the time, which was a weekend executive program, which was amazing to be able to check out of your work and home life and focus on your education every other weekend and and then a week in the spring and a week in the fall. And there's still, you know, executive programs like that out there. This was really before online was an option. I mean, we did have yeah. the internet, but <laughs> it was really <laughs> at the beginning. Um, I graduated from that program in 96. So that was still evolving and it really fit into my life. And it was it, it, the quality of the program was exceptional. I, I felt like it checked off all the boxes I needed to advance into an administrative role. And it was my ticket, actually. I did had to do another internship as part of that program. And at Spalding, a senior VP in charge of business planning and development hired me, my boss let me do this with her for the summer, which was actually the opening of the hospital I now work in. So I was like a project manager. I really got to meet incredible people I never would have, um, do finance work, budget work, purchasing. I mean, I was on site with a hard hat, taking in equipment, and it was really because of the MHA program that led to me it, having a permanent administrative role with Spalding. Would you recommend an MHA? So we no longer have the MHA, but but I'm going to say uh, uh, we are looking at bringing it back. I so hope. Uh, I hope I'm hoping to, um, in the next year or two we, we might we may bring back an executive oh, MHA that would program. Be wonderful! Oh, I had the best. Perhaps. It was amazing. Um, yeah. I, I do. I think there's different options. You know, I have a, a, a young friend that I've been kind of a mentor to who is getting her MBA with a healthcare concentration, and I looked at some of her coursework, and it was very similar to the MHA. I I, I think that that there's a few options for people and either one might be a good fit. I think if you're really destined to work in healthcare, certainly making sure that if it's a concentrated one, that it really checks those boxes and covers health policy, which is so different than the business world and healthcare finance, which is, you know, amazingly different <laughs> than the business world. So, you know, I think it depends on the quality of the program and the curriculum. Okay. So you did the, you did the MHA and it kind of led to some opportunities. It sounds like the organization was receptive to kind of helping you yep. develop. And so really, uh, that's really great. And then you, and so you did something with the, with the strategy unit. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you took a, a assignment as the administrative director of the Burbank Spalding Rehabilitation Center in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that organization and, and that role. So that was really, again, a milestone, I guess, because it was my first real administrative role. So the other one was my first supervisory, and this was really me owning operations of a unit. So Spalding was in a management contract with this 24-bed unit at an acute care hospital out in Fitchburg, and 
you know, I went there thinking I'd be there for two months. I ended up being there for two years and really learned a lot. So at the time, that bigger organization was under a lot of financial stress. They were consolidating. There was a consulting company in that was really cutting positions and, and really trying to save the organization as a whole, but were definitely perceived as the bad guys coming in to cut and eliminate. So I came in as a contract employee from Spalding, just trying to run that unit and ended up having a lot of challenges that I am grateful for now because I had no experience in union negotiations and had to go through that. And it was ugly and difficult. And and I actually cried a lot, <laughs> um, but I learned a ton. And I had to work with this consulting company that I didn't really report to, but they were like, you know, on me every day for metrics about staffing and meeting budget and admissions and all these things. I was really thrown into the fire. I had great support from Spalding, but I really attribute that kind of tough, tough two years to building a, a, my character a little and strength yeah, and learning yeah. a lot of things that I really even haven't encountered that much since. It was really pretty challenging. That, that sounds really challenging. Does it, it sounds like maybe you had three bosses kind of, I mean, maybe not formally, but did, yeah. did you still kind of report to Spalding? I did. So I had my, yeah, my, my main employer was still Spalding, but I was accountable to the organization that we were based in and uh, those two didn't always align so it was and, you know, then, and then the consultant group that was yeah, yeah. tearing through there as well right, right. maybe yeah. but okay. i learned i i did i really again i learned to um you know i i i think i would say oh I'm, I'm young i'm new i don't have that much experience but i learned to be tougher and to stand up for the needs of our unit and also how to choose your battles which i think is one of the critical you know takeaways from all of my years is fight for what really matters and let the little stuff go and you end up gaining the respect of the more senior people by doing that when you were in that role were you were you the only spalding employee on the ground or, uh, or did you come in with a team? yeah no i was yeah Okay. Yep. The rest, wow. everyone worked for the hospital. Yeah. What was that like try having that? I mean, so you're the people you were working with day to day were, did they see you as an outsider? I mean, like how, how did you kind of establish yourself with well, that? I, you know, that's what's maybe it's unique to rehab. I mean, it's again, so team oriented that there was a real camaraderie. They welcomed, it wasn't a new contract. Spalding had been there for several years. The manager okay. had moved on. So that's when I came in. So they had a good relationship with Spalding. They needed that rehab expertise that Spalding brought to the table. They were going through some accreditation surveys of which I had good experience with. So I, I, you know, I'm still friends with some of those people all these years later. It was, it wasn't contentious. It was more contentious on the hospital to Spalding side versus the unit itself. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. So, I mean, stepping into that role, so you were the uh, administrative director. So like you'd said, you'd had been a kind of in the clinical space mm -hmm. doing focused on therapy. Now you stepped out. So what else were you doing? You were obviously still over, or you were still overseeing the clinical yeah. side of things yep. there? Absolutely. Well. So okay. I had to oversee all the clinical care, nursing, therapies, all reported to me, um, marketing and liaison a little bit to try and get patients in. Um, I did my first budgets I did there. I'd never done a budget. I, and I, you know, was still in graduate school at that point. So um, that was great. And yeah, and then the union negotiations, that was huge. Definitely oh, never okay. had done that before. Yeah. How, how many employees were you responsible for I, at I that point? I think there was about 60 at that point. Yeah. It's a big organization. Yeah. First of all, multiple year, levels. Have, yeah. And multiple levels of supervision. Oh, right. Absolutely. So, got, so the supervisors reported to me and yeah. Yeah. So what was that like? So that's kind of, that's often like making the jump to supervisor is one kind of important milestone in a manager's career, but then moving into that role where you're now managing managers right. is, is another kind of milestone in my mind that you, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, I think, um, this, this is probably another, you know, huge thing for people to be, how do I word it? Self-reflective a little bit. I think, uh, being an outgoing person, someone who likes to be friends with people, that was hard to kind of put on that administrative hat and be the decision maker and sometimes have to make unpopular decisions. And I think I learned a lot of that there. I'm probably still learning that to some degree, but I think that 
you couldn't be chums with everyone. You had to be the boss. And it was great to celebrate meaningful events with people, but I, I really couldn't befriend someone and go to the movies on Saturday night. That wouldn't have been appropriate. And that was a hard shift for me, having always been a colleague and now being the administrator. I also don't, I'm not someone who really cares about titles or being, you know, perceived as the boss. I don't really like that. Yeah. So that was hard too, because I was the boss. <laughs> so I need to right, recognize right. that. Yeah. So, but now you're, I guess what I'm interested in is you're now leading through other people. Right. How did that change your management style? I think that I learned delegation better. I, I was used to doing everything myself, right? And now all of a sudden I had to let go of control a little bit and have, I was fortunate to have pretty strong supervisors and have them take ownership of things, empower them to do that, but also establish good work habits like regular meetings and checking in and being able to counsel people who weren't getting to where they needed to be. I think I figured out during that experience to really know who the rock stars are. You know, I was able to assess who had the good gut and the good ability to supervise well and to manage well, and also pick out the people who really need extra help with that through trial and error. I mean, this was my first administrative job, and I think I did some of it well, but I've grown since then for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, okay, so you were there, like you said, for about two years, mm -hmm. and then, uh, so you were out in Fitchburg, so for folks who are not familiar with Massachusetts geography, you're kind of central, central uh, middle of the state, and then you jumped from there in 1997 to the Rehabilitation Hospital of the Cape and Islands in East Sandwich, Mass., which, as the name implies, is on the is on Cape Cod in kind of the south southeastern part of the state. So you're pretty far, yes. uh, geograph big geographic move, kind of probably a cultural shift as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. What made you decide to, and, and this is at the time, um, this was not part of the Spalding system, well, right? It, it, it was. So Spalding it was. opened the rehab hospital to Cape and Islands also under a management contract. They were okay. um, charged with building and opening this hospital, and that was what my project had been back when I was still in okay. Boston working on my master's and, and doing my internship. So when we opened this hospital in Sandwich, you know, my dream really was to someday get to the Cape. You know, okay. the Cape is a lifestyle. The Cape is <laughs> spectacularly beautiful. It's also a little remote. And I thought it'd be a great place to honestly raise my family, but still be able to have a vibrant career. I kind of wanted both. I was willing, you know, I was sort of done with the city and, and I love nature and, and I kept hoping the right job would open up for me here at the Cape and it did. So that is really what led me to leave Fitchburg was that it was a dream come true. <laughs> Okay. So at the time it was, okay, so help me understand the, um, like the status of the organization. So it was managed at the time was managed by uh, Spalding, yeah. Yeah. but not owned by Spalding. So not it's complicated. We were our own independent yeah. corporation and we still are, but the land we sit on was at the time owned by Mass General Hospital. So already like from when Partners was created back in, uh, I forget what year, we were in it right from the get-go because we okay. were part of that family, but we each were functioning on our own tubs. We weren't a consolidated finance organization. It was just, we were all had this kind of loose affiliation, like we were cousins, but we weren't okay. as formalized as it is today. So... Okay. Um, the at the time, you know, we would talk to Spalding in Boston and try to share policies and best practices, but just in a friendly way. Okay, yeah. all right. So basically, you've been so you've now been at the, this organization uh, since 1997. So it's I have. it's changed its identity a little bit. Uh, uh, I think in 2000. So we'll just kind of jump forward a little bit here. Sure. In 2010, yep. you you. The, the relationship became a little more formalized. Is that correct? Correct. So there was, yes, there was an effort to, instead of us being on our own tubs, to have one almost parent. So we are part of the, the Mothership Partners Healthcare, which is ginormous, you know, Mass General, the Brigham, and many hospitals underneath. And then within that, we created a division of post-acute care. So that's where all the Spalding sit and the home care company. And it was then in 2010 that um, that Spalding Rehab Network was really created and where we made a commitment to share leadership across the sites 
to try and reduce cost. I mean, honestly, we each had our own CEOs and now we have one CEO for all of us. And it is a way to um, help our financial picture because this is a hard, hard uh, part of healthcare to be in. So how can we make it more efficient and cost effective? Um, so now we very much share, like if there's a policy here, typically it's going to match the policy in the other spaldings. We really try to do things in concert. So we've talked a little bit about rehabilitation hospitals. Let's, let's talk a little more about that specifically. Uh, what is a rehabilitation hospital and how is it different from an, your, your typical community acute care hospital? Sure. Sure. So, um, you know, it really starts with something bad happening to someone, which is, could be anything. It might be a scheduled elective surgery, or it might be as devastating as a stroke. And there comes a point where being in the acute care is just not necessary anymore. And how do we get this person back to their life? And that's where rehab comes in. And, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, people would come to rehab and stay for two, three, four weeks at a time. And that has really changed. And we are a very short-term, intense approach to getting people home. And it's our average length to stay here is only two weeks. So patients come in, someone with a stroke might stay three to four weeks, but someone who's coming in following cardiac surgery or an elective knee surgery will only stay seven to nine days. And they get a lot of therapy. Most of our patients get three hours of therapy a day. So think about it, to go to the gym for three hours would be impossible. So these folks who've gone through something very serious medically are getting intense occupational speech, physical, recreational therapy all day. And they, we also have doctors here 24 seven. So it almost looks like a med surge unit of a regular acute care hospital. So we're staffed like that. We have this office, nurses, you know, have five or six patients each. There's doctors here 24 seven. There's, we have patients on cardiac telemetry. We have patients who are on, you know, serious IV medications. And it's all been that shift in healthcare where patients are kind of pushed along the continuum more and more quickly. So okay. they leave the acute care following cardiac surgery day three. And they come here and we're like, hey, time to get up. <laughs> and they're, chest was just opened and they're like, you're kidding, right? No, you know, it's, it's, we're going to get you moving. Patients here are dressed. They're not in Johnny's and every day they get stronger and stronger and start to kind of believe that they're going to get better, which is the exciting part of rehab. Well, let me, let me pause for a second. Sure. So let's say, let's say cardiac surgery. So you might go in for what kind of, you might, you, you are identified as having a particular issue. So for example, what might, what's an example of something? Uh, that would well, happen? someone may have a massive heart attack on the beach and, okay. or on the golf okay. course, happens all the time. And they end up in the emergency room and they quickly go in for um, cabbage, so a coronary artery bypass. And after that surgery, some people can go home, but a lot of people are very weak, deconditioned. Maybe they had a complication during surgery and they're not ready to go home. So they'll come. And all this happens, and all this happens at the acute care hospital. Correct. So this might be happening at, you might get taken to, by ambulance to Mass General, let's Correct. say. Correct, yep. And you'll have the initial treatment at Mass General. Right. You've had, and so you've had that now. Three and, days, and probably. Three days. Yep. And Intensive care. Yes. And, yep. then, and then three days and then, and then and they then come they to you. And then they call us, <laughs> the okay. acute care hospital, and it's all done by computer now, of course. And they send the person by ambulance to us where they are admitted and it very much feels like a regular hospital at that point because you're being admitted again and you're still have your wires and your tubes and all the things you might need. The difference is that that next day, some lovely therapist comes in and says it's time to get up and get moving. Time to get up. Yeah. Okay. So the focus, the focus of the acute care hospital is the initial treatment and stabilization. Correct. Um, and then, the pressure is to get those patients out of that environment and to uh, the next level, a, a level down of care. Yes. Is that yeah. The, the right care way? is the highest cost level of care. And then, you know, you come to rehab, it's a little more cost effective in terms of what the insurance companies are paying out. And the goal is always to try and get someone to home versus a skilled nursing facility or, and as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. So I've had, so I've, I'm a patient, I've had a heart attack, I've 
gone into Mass General. I've had a cabbage mm -hmm. three days and they're like, hey, it's time for you to, you're not ready to go home, right? So that's the yeah. idea here. We're going to send you uh, down to the Cape for a lovely vacation on the Cape <laughs> uh, <laughs> where, to, to, to the rehabilitation hospital. Mm -hmm. Who is on my team taking care of me? Right. So you'll have a physiatrist who is a medical doctor who specializes in physical medicine and rehab. Um, you will have RNs around the clock. You will have um, personal care associates or CNAs. We call them PCAs now, and they are specially trained in rehab as well. So in the acute care, we talk a lot about toileting and rehab, just to warn you, but you know, in the acute care, people will help you get to the bathroom and do all those things that you need to do to go home eventually too. But here we really focus on teaching the patient how to do it as independently and safely as possible. So our CNAs look different than the CNAs in the acute care hospital. Um, you'll have physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy if you need it, if you have trouble swallowing or speaking, if you've had a, a stroke or something like that. I mentioned recreational therapy. You'll have social work and case management. It's a huge team. We have pharmacy on site. We have laboratory services. It really is a hospital. It's just the focus of what we're doing is different. Okay. Yeah. And so it's a longer stay. Mm -hmm. So I'm there now. I'm there. I'm checked in. The physiatrist has has is coordinating my care. Yep. I assume with the, and um, when do I go home? Well, so, how, how do you know it's? Yeah. How do we know? So it's really um, largely about medical stability on one side. So the physician and the nurses making sure that the patient is medically okay to go home, that their medications are all lined up. We do a lot of medication management. Sometimes patients come in here on 30 medications and trying to get that list to a manageable level and make sure they're the right drugs. And then there's the rehab side with the OT and the PT and others saying they're strong enough, they're safe to walk around. You know, they'll assess whether their home has stairs, whether they live alone, whether they can manage their medications on their own. Do they need a ramp if they're going home in a wheelchair? Or will they be able to get to outpatient therapy? Or will they have home care at home for a while? Um, which is typically what happens. You know, all those multitude of pieces, you know, get the family in, help train the family to get them in and out of a car what are they are they going back to work if they're going back to work what do they need to be able to accomplish to do that successfully so we have team meetings twice a week on every single patient to monitor the progress towards both our goals for what we think would be safe for them at home but also on what their goals are that's most important is what is the patient hoping to accomplish and when all that lines up we usually have a date in mind for how long it will take and and actually the insurance companies drive a lot of that too. So <laughs> Medicare is our biggest payer because the Cape is a retirement community with a very older demographic here. And many people, this was their second home and they retired and made it their primary residence. And a lot of people live down here without their children close by, which is unusual also because their children are still off in Boston or wherever doing their thing and they're down here. So it's sometimes harder to get people home because they don't have the supports necessarily and they are older. So when we compare ourselves to rehab hospitals nationwide, our group tends to be a little more like Arizona and Florida, a little older and right. presents a different set of challenges. But a, a typical cardiac patient between seven and nine days, if we're sticking with that example, and they've gotten stronger and they're not afraid to move and we've made sure that their incision and all of that is good and communicate with their cardiologist and the sooner the better for people, get them back to their own place. And um, then they can come here for outpatient as well. We have a large outpatient program. Okay. So how does reimbursement work for the ho on the hospital side? Sure. So Medicare is our largest uh, payer and it's challenging. Um, the regulations, we have a huge regulatory change happening, 10-1, so just two weeks from now where they've mixed up our entire mechanism for submitting for payment and what we have to document. And it seems every few years they love to do that. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's always a struggle to balance um, what we're being paid for the services we provide. And like I said, we're, we're lucky to break even. The private insurances pay a little bit better. We fall under because we're part of Partners. Partners has contracted our rates but it, it still barely covers the cost of the care. This is an expensive level of care when you think about all those clinicians involved in getting someone home. Is it DRG based or is it, um, similar. Or is it a per day or per diem? It's very similar to DRG. It's called a CMG, 
but it's basically the same model. So you're paying a lump sum payment for the care to get that patient discharged. And whether it takes 10 days or 80 days, you're going to get that same amount of payment. So there's a real strong uh, incentive to, to get them out uh, within the time frame that, that the, the CMG is designed for. There is, but unfortunately, this gets to a broader sort of healthcare policy issue. But over the years, the rehab industry has shot itself in the foot, probably similar to the GRGs, because every year they adjust it. So we work harder to get people out sooner, and then CMS adjusts the, the average length of stay for that CMG. So lengths of stay just every year go down and down until I'm like, well, a stroke patient will stay a week. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. So that's a right. frustration of being in healthcare administration is that, you know, our healthcare system, I hope this isn't heresy, I see is very, very broken, that there are weird incentives for how we provide care. One of them being to hurry people along because we're only allowed so many days. It just doesn't make sense. So I a lot of nursing homes sitting next to my desk. Yeah, I'm no. to <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're alone on that yeah. soapbox. <laughs> Crowded soapbox. Um, uh, so a lot of nursing homes have moved from kind of custodial care into rehabilitation. Where does where do they fit? kind of in the landscape of rehab. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Relative to the, yeah, that's a relative to the rehabilitation hospital. Right. So, you know, nursing homes are allowed to sort of hang that shingle that they provide rehab. It is a completely different level of care. It's an important level of care because there are certainly people who cannot tolerate the intensity of a rehab hospital where they need to heal longer, recuperate longer, and get a little bit of therapy. And that is pretty much what's happening at skilled nursing facilities. My mom was recently here and in the skilled nursing, so I can kind of judge firsthand too. I and mean, it was just like I pictured. She would get like an hour of PT, you know, maybe, maybe every day, maybe not. She'd get some OT. But, you know, here Medicare requires us and we provide three hours a day. So it's, it's really about intensity, but they do serve a very important piece in the continuum. And sometimes we have patients who might finish their rehab course, but they're still just too weak perhaps, or they need to do some home modifications and they'll go to skilled nursing and finish their rehab there. But it's at a much slower pace and um, not as aggressive. How many beds at, at your facility? We have 60 inpatient beds. And is that a large, large for a ho rehabilitation no. hospital? Or? Yeah, it's pretty it, uh, small to medium, I would say. Like Spalding Boston has 132 beds. Um, okay. And some of the renowned ones in the country, Rehab Institute of Chicago, Kessler, they have very large hospitals. But we're in a fairly rural area, so it meets the needs of our community. And, 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 and you've mentioned that a couple of times. So it, it is... Is the facility primarily oriented towards um, the local community? So you're not getting a lot of people aren't flying in from someplace else to get right. there. I mean, occasionally, if their family is here, we do get people, but mostly we service the Cape, South Shore of Massachusetts, like Plymouth area, um, a little uh -huh. bit of like New Bedford, if people know the geography. But a lot of people from the Cape, though, still do go to Boston for their care. We do have a local healthcare system that's excellent, Cape Cod Healthcare, but they will, if the, all their doctors were always at Mass General or Brigham and Women's, they'll still go off Cape and come back for their rehab. How does, how does uh, your facility kind of integrate into the larger Spalding Rehabilitation Network? Sure. So my boss is actually our president of Spalding Cape Cod, but also the COO of Spalding Boston, Spalding Cambridge, and we have a nursing home, Spalding Brighton. And like I said, we really try to tie our services together. So I'll use kind of a silly example, hand washing. You know, we're very concerned with um, infection control and not spreading infection between patients. And um, so if we have infection control policies here at Spalding Cape Cod, they sure should be the same. It's Spalding Boston, Spalding Cambridge, Spalding Brighton. So those kind of things we've really tried to standardize. So there's a lot of work around that. We also share a lot of the corporate functions. So HR is shared across the network, IT, finance, development, I'm forgetting some, Marcom, marketing and communications, our network level structures so that you know we're not all doing this replicating and doing the same things and doing them differently. There's a, a concerted collaborative approach to all of that so let's uh so so let's now kind of transition to talk about your career within kind of within the organization since you arrived on the cape sure. uh, you came in 
and I'm just going to kind of read them real quick. You came in as the director of the inpatient programs for about six years. Then in 2003, you were promoted to vice president of clinical services. Uh, you later became the vice president for hospital operations for the hospital and vice president of clinical ancillary services for the whole network. So, um, and that's what you, that's your, those are your current titles. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, Tell me a little bit about the journey that you were on from director to vice president of operations. Sure. Um, you know, when I came in as director, it was probably the right job for me at the time. I still had a lot of learning to do. It was only my second administrative position. And at that point, I was really responsible for nursing and therapies on the inpatient program, which was much larger than the side I was coming from. So during that six years, my boss, I used to joke, was my work soulmate. We were very in tune with each other. And over the years, I kept getting more and more responsibility as she gained more trust and saw my skills growing. And that's when I eventually became the vice president of clinical services and took over, started to take over areas outside of inpatient. So pharmacy and lab and different ancillary services as well. And I think it was both because I was growing, but also because she was seeing it as an opportunity to build, I guess we'll be talking about this in a couple of weeks, more secession planning and thinking about who's, you know, she always used to say, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I need you to know this. And it was a great opportunity for me to grow. So that was great. And then we had a fairly large change when the network was formed where she, my boss at the time, um, left and was no longer our CEO here. And that's when I became the vice president for the hospital where really you know, I'm in charge of the day to day. I report to my CEO who's off site now and she comes down maybe twice a month. I'm, I'm pretty autonomous and she's wonderful. We have a great working relationship. We check in all the time, but I really gained a responsibility for the entire organization, which was a big change and a, a little daunting at first, but exciting at the same time. So so you're, uh, so vice president sounds like you have somebody immediately above you on the ground, but that's not the case. You actually are the, the senior administrator on a day-to-day -day basis for the facility. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. So what was it like moving, I mean, uh, adding programs, adding things like pharmacy, mm -hmm. uh, radiology and lab and so forth that maybe you hadn't really worked in directly. Oh, I mean, you've been therapist. around, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, right, right. I mean, that, that's home, right? That's always easy to go back to. And I think a lot of, I mean, that's a, that's a major growth point where now you're in charge of things that you're familiar with, but you know, yeah. th this is not, you know, you're not a radiologist, right? Like you're not a, you didn't have a rad tech background. So Correct. what was it like picking up those areas and how did you learn to manage those areas? Yeah, I, I think that this is where um, humility is the number one thing. Every area that I've taken over, and it seems like every day I'm picking up a new one, I, I say, I do not, you know, know your work very well at all. But what I can provide is help as you make decisions, help on the things that you maybe don't know, like the finance side, the budgeting side, the personnel side, the counseling, all of those things that you know managers struggle with sometimes, I can provide the counsel and the support and help you with that. But I'm going to count on you to guide the clinical work and give me the information I need to know to be effective, but don't expect me to become a pharmacist overnight. It's just not going to happen. And this is where really good hiring and really good performance management with people is so critical because, you know, if, if the lab director isn't doing a good job, I'm not really in a good place to take over and run the lab for him. So it, it really means just having strong people and them knowing my limitations and me empowering them to lead well. And I've built, fortunately, a really good team. And I've learned a lot. I mean, I know more about radiology and pharmacy and lab than I ever thought I would. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I still wouldn't be prepared to lead it solely tomorrow because I don't have that right. clinical background. Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. What advice would you give to folks who are making, making that uh, transition to stepping into that, that level of leadership? Yeah. So maybe they've been you know, in their comfort zone and now they're going to move into an area where they're now going to manage, like you, you know, manage parts of the organization that they really don't have the direct familiarity with. Right. I think that spending time in that space is really important, which I've done at all those departments, is to just watch how the departments function, how people interact, 
and what the work actually is and hearing from the people who know the work, what are their biggest challenges? What are their worries? You know, what are the things that make their job difficult? Because that's the stuff that we want to fix, right? And that I can often help fix, even if I'm not a pharmacist, I can still come up with possible ideas of making things work more smoothly. So I think a little bit of embedding is very important. And also, I, I think the really being honest to say, I'm not here to tell you how to be a pharmacist. That, you know, that would be such a mistake. But I think I've seen people approach things like that, you know, that they go in <laughs> thinking that they can really tell these people how to run their department when they know nothing about the, the clinical work that's occurring. So I make it very clear from the get-go, that is my management style, and it's not what I'm going to do, but I am here to help you. So, you know, those are my biggest advice points, I think, for people, is don't try to, don't try to know it. You didn't go to school for it, so. <laughs> right, you know. right. So you also have this role as the vice president of clinical mm -hmm. services for the network. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is that role and what do you do in that role? Sure. It, I really love that part of my job. So I oversee lab, pharmacy, radiology, spiritual care, and materials management for the network. So all the managers of those departments at our four other locations report to me. So my job has really been to bring, um, I'll use pharmacy as the example, um, the three other pharmacy directors all together so that they can communicate well with each other and not do crazy different things at each site and to use each other as a resource, especially pharmacy is a good example. There's so many regulations. It's a highly regulated under the spotlight. Everything is changing kind of area that they work well together so that all of our departments are in a good place. So I have to meet with them all regularly. I usually on Wednesdays, I spend my day in Boston and I meet with my different department managers and I've done some moving and shaking too. So for radiology, we had like supervisors at each site and they were great clinical people, but they didn't necessarily have the management skills to take the department into the future. So we took one who was a superstar and gave him responsibility for all the radiology departments. And they're all loving it because he takes a lot of the headaches off of their plates and they're able to do their work. So looking at opportunities like that, regular meetings, obviously I do the performance appraisals on all those people and just try to connect them so that we're standardizing where it makes sense. So you've been in the rehabilitation space really your whole career. I have, um, yeah. What's particularly rewarding about working in the rehabilitation space? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as I've thought about over the years, occasionally kind of reflecting, like, should I do something different? Should I, you know, am I too, have I created this niche that I'll never get out of? Um, I think about what drew me to rehab in the beginning. And it's that, I hope this doesn't sound trite, but people get better, like miracles happen. You know, you seek someone coming in who, you know, can't even tie their shoes one day and they walk out our front door. And it's just a very fulfilling part of healthcare. So when I get frustrated with, you know, the greater healthcare and the mess that I think we're in, I remember why I show up for work every day. And it's for the patients who are in those beds who we're all going to be one of them someday too. So it's, it's really um, a very fulfilling, something I have a lot of passion about. And I think that it's okay that I landed in a niche. It's, it's, it's it doesn't mean I'm, you know, not challenging myself. It's what I love. So that's where I've landed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. It's great to, I mean, I think it's really important to find that, that niche, right? To find that place where you really belong. It's great. What do you see, what, what are the exciting trends in the industry or, or maybe scary trends in the industry? Yeah, no, ex I think exciting. There's, you know, robotics is amazing. So there's people who have spinal cord injuries that may be able to walk through the use of robotic devices. Um, there's amazing research into spinal cord injury and spinal cord rejuvenation and all of that. I, I just love reading about it. I, I hope in my lifetime I'll see that there is something that helps people who have that kind of injury move again. The advocacy I talked about at the very beginning, you know, I think people with disabilities have really come to the forefront, you know, and living their best life. And, you know, I remember 20 years ago, accessibility was our concern. Can you even get into a building? Well, now in most cases, accessibility has been resolved or is resolving. So now it's like, 
great, they can get in the building. Why aren't you hiring them? You know, we're huge advocates for employment of people with disabilities and full participation in life of a person with a disability. And I talked about the adaptive sports, with, which I think is a real ticket for people to see that there's hope and that there's, for lack of a better word, a normal full life. You know, there's nothing that should hold someone back who has a disability. And those are the really wonderful trends that I see happening. In our- I actually, was ju- as you said that, I was jotting down adaptive sports because we had mentioned it. I talked about like Northeast Passage has a big adaptive sports yep. program. So you guys have an adaptive sports program as we well? Do. Do have- we partner though with Northeast Passage for skiing and some of the um, winter sports especially. Um, but Spalding has a center. It's, it's based in Boston, but we have a ton of things that happen down here on the Cape. We actually have a center on the Cape. A lot of things happen right here on a sandwich, but um, if you go further down the arm, in the middle of the Cape is Brewster, and there is a state park that we collaborated with the state of Massachusetts to develop an adaptive sports center there. So, you know, children with disabilities can go camping with their families in a fully accessible campground with accessible bathrooms and showers, and then they can go bike riding on the bike trail, or they could go fishing, or they could go kayaking with the support of our adaptive sports programs. And, you know, we've had families say we could never do this type of vacation because we'd get somewhere and then what, you know, but now we can all go for a bike ride. It's amazing. And it sounds so simple, but it's really a really important part of our mission. And um, what, what do we mean? What do you mean when you say adaptive sports? What is what is that? broadly referred. So I guess I'll use uh, my friend as an example. So she has a progressive disease that has caused her to be blind. And before she was blind, she loved to ski. She loved to bike ride. She loved to kayak. She has two boys. She loved to just be outside enjoying life with her family. And because of her blindness, she can't hop on a bicycle. She can't ski down a mountain without a assistance of a program that has the equipment and the personnel to make sure it's done safely. So she has done adaptive skiing, probably maybe through Northeast Passage, where she skis in tandem with someone who's sighted. So they will lead her down the mountain, but very, she can feel the wind in her hair and experience nature and ski with her family. Um, we went bike riding on the Cape Cod Canal the other night with two recumbent bikes hitched together. So I'm in the front bike because I'm sighted. I steer, I pedal. But let me tell you, she was working just as hard as I was. <laughs> and it was very windy, so we had a great workout. And she can bike ride. And to be honest, we both forget she's blind when we're riding our bikes. You know, we're just out. Right. She can hear the birds and the ships and talk with other people. And it's a wonderful experience. So it gives people the tools and the expertise to do something that they may think they could never do again. I've seen like I've spent a little bit of time over in the Northeast Passage uh, area and looking at like I think of like you said like a, a, a recumbent bikes that are built for two so that a sighted person can do it but a lot of time uh, like the Northeast Passage has hand cycles yep. so it's a bicycle that is powered you can power with your hands rather than your feet if you aren't able to use your legs for whatever Absolutely. reason. Absolutely, we have so a whole fleet so the, of those. Yes. Yeah. And the so, kayaks so the, too, special kayaks so that someone who might not have good trunk control can sit comfortably and paddle, or maybe they only have use of one hand. So they have special paddles that can be one handed for kayaking. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. So it's partly, it's partly adapt, uh, adaptive in the sense of you're modifying the equipment, but it's also kind of solving the problem of, of what is it that the person needs in order to engage in this, in this activity, right? Right, like, right. And there's yeah. hockey really a, teams a cool. and basketball teams and curling. Te- it's it's just endless. The um, And it, again, 20 years ago, these things weren't, they were available in pockets, but now it's really affordable and available to a greater population, which is awesome. Now, we didn't really talk about your outpatient side, but you mentioned you, you have an outpatient program or, or outpatient uh, operation as well. What do you, uh, how does that kind of fit into the, um, portfolio of of activities? Sure. So Spalding Cape Cod has five outpatient locations. Um, Spalding Network has 25. So we are really try to support our patients who leave the hospital but still need ongoing care and treatment. So really all ages, we have specialized pediatric centers and we treat any injury, any illness, sports injuries, post-stroke, it's OT, PT, speech, physicians, 
we have an adaptive driving program, which is very cool. So someone has had an event that leaves them feeling or being very unsafe to drive, but their goal is to get back on the road. We have specially trained occupational therapists who can evaluate as well as provide retraining. We even have a car that uh, the state has deemed us an actual driving school. So we can say to someone, you are safe to drive or you are not safe to drive and give them their, when they pass eventually, hopefully give them their permission to get back on the road. You know, it's all about independence and people reaching their highest level. And driving is often one of the biggest barriers for folks, especially on the Cape where there's not a lot of public transportation. People rely on their right. cars. Yeah. Right. Well, so as the vice president in charge of the overall hospital, what, what keeps you up at night? Yeah, just a few things. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the regulatory challenges, for sure. It's just, you know, you, you, for a year you think you're in good shape and wham, some policy wonk makes a really crazy decision without understanding the impacts down the food chain. And right now, like I said, there's a big one for us. I also think being able to keep up with the market in terms of salaries has been a real challenge for us. So there are for-profit rehab providers who do their business in a very different way, um, who maybe provide less staff or treat patients in groups versus individually, and, and they're able to keep their costs down more. I would you know, challenge that the quality might be different and the outcome's different, but they're able to provide bigger, greater salaries, and we're struggling with that right now. We've been losing therapists somewhat to um, home care agencies and other places that can pay more, and um, it's worrying me a lot because we have very little turnover here. People choose the lifestyle. It's a great place to work. The benefits are good and all that, and we're, we're starting to see an impact on the salary side that definitely is keeping me awake at night. So I want to uh, transition and kind of close out the interview talking a little bit about leadership. Sure. So- um, could you kind of encapsulate what you would call your, uh, what, what your leadership philosophy is? Yeah. You know, that's, I really thought about that a lot because, um, I, I, I wasn't sure how to describe it, but I think in the end it's relational. I really believe, especially in this business, I guess too, it's maybe more important than in other businesses is that your leadership is only as good as the relationships you have with the people who are working for the organization. So I really am one of those people where I strive to know, I mean, we have 500 employees, so sadly I don't know everyone anymore. I used to, when we had 200, I could do it. Now I'm lost, <laughs> but you know, it, sometimes it's the small things, knowing that someone just had a baby or that their dog died or that their mom is sick. I really sincerely care about that in the people that work here because it impacts their ability to work and their ability to, you know, be all in when they're here. So I, I really believe in having strong, solid relationships with staff and with the managers that I work with. And I, I think that's the ticket to effective leadership, honestly. One of the tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of tickets to effective leadership, what makes a good leader? Um, I, I talked about this a little bit already, but not being too authoritarian. I see that mistake and I've worked for those people and I hate it. <laughs> um, having humility and not being afraid to go make beds if we're short staffed one day and being able to say, how can I help? I make a good unit secretary, I've decided, but other than that, I'm not much help anymore. Um, being a approachable and not just, you know, oh, I have office hours today. Uh, no, my door is open unless I'm really, like right now it's closed, but normally, come in and say hello. You know, I had the nurse scheduler popped in this morning to say hi to me. I was thrilled. You know, it, it's being um, a real person, not being too lofty and too hung up on titles and position. I think in, integrity and in business practice, which, you know, now with over 20 years in this business, you know, holding on to your integrity is critically important and not compromising. That's when I draw the line. You know, there's things I let go and there's things I don't. And if there are issues of integrity, I'm not afraid to speak up. In inclusivity and respecting diversity in our workforce and seeing that diversity is an asset um, and, you know, wouldn't it be great if we we're all, you know, cookie cutter, but what makes the world interesting is that we're all different. So really respecting that I think is important in leadership. Okay. So when you, you mentioned a couple of times, uh, I think, uh, uh, hiring well, mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? And, and what do you look for when you're hiring leaders in particular? Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny. I, I would say interviewing is not one of my strengths and 
but over the years we we try to do it in a very we're kind of known for over interviewing people we put them through a gauntlet and make sure a lot of different people are involved and what i really look for is that person who is a little bit type a you know you definitely have to have someone who's got it together especially in operations where it's details and there's fires every day and you have to be able to focus and get the job done um, but knowing when to give it up to someone who's not self-promoting i'm not a fan of people who continually toot their own horn this is a team effort and none of it your greatest achievement wouldn't have happened if you didn't have betty sitting next to you so someone who sees the value of team People who are inflexible, I find I don't work well with. I also struggle, I think, having people who have enough confidence. I talked about having humility, but I think people also have to have enough confidence in their skills. They wouldn't be interviewing for this job if they weren't following a trajectory that led them to this place. So confidence, flexibility, not too self-promoting, definitely not an authoritarian type of management. So you, you talked about leadership and, and kind of the behaviors and and kind of those things that make a good leader. You mentioned mentors, so I'm wondering: is there a linkage here between kind of did did and you've mentioned them a couple of times? You had good mentors. Did. did those mentors help you develop that leadership philosophy? That the your views on leadership and yeah. and how did mentors kind of help you move through your career? Yeah, I, I really. I had probably two people in my life that I considered mentors. One was my first boss at Spalding when I was a rec therapist. And, you know, like I said, from the get-go, she saw that I had, you know, a future. She saw that I had, the, the world was wide open to me. And she really asked me, like, almost day one, what do you want to do? I had no idea, of course, but she always asked that. What are your goals? What do you want? Not how can I keep you here for 10 years, but how, what do you want to grow? How do you want to become new leader or whatever. And so that openness and willingness and constant dialogue was amazing. And she gave me a lot of opportunities and she advocated for me a lot too, to be given, you know, again, a rec therapist, people were sometimes like, what, you want her to become a project manager? You know, how do you make that shift? And she advocated for me and gave me an opportunity to advocate for myself. So great relationship. And then my boss here at Spalding Cape Cod, our former CEO, that I referred to as my work soulmate, I learned a ton from her. And she, again, kept giving me increasing levels of responsibility, even things that were a real stretch. And she would say that. She goes, this is going to be a stretch for you, but I want you to try it. And she would give me those opportunities and give me great feedback. I've always been open to feedback, too, which I think is critical for leaders not to be, you know, to let me know. Bring it on. I, I want to know how I could have done this better. And my boss to this day, I say that to her, I'm like, ugh, did I make a miss on that? And she says, I'll let you, you know, worry about it for 15 minutes and let it go. But she'll give you that feedback, which is great. So um, two wonderful mentors that opened doors for me and supported me and were honest. So how important is mentoring in your perspective in terms of leadership development? And, and are you involved in, do you, do you feel like you are currently uh, a mentor to other other upcoming executives? I am. I, I think um, that there's probably one person in specifically right now who I'm kind of taking that same approach my boss took with me, and I'm pushing him a little to think outside the box. He happens to work in radiology, and I'm like, you are not limited to radiology. I was not limited to rec therapy. I want you to think about of all the things we do together, the projects we work on, you know, what jazzes you, you know, what is it marketing? Is it developed? I have no idea, but what are you interested in? Because once you kind of have an inkling, let's try to get you more involved. And then you can say, Ooh, I was wrong about that. But at least you're testing the waters and you're thinking about what I can do next. You know, what's next? Because, you know, he's a young guy and he's running a small radiology department. I'm like, the worst thing would be if you left this organization. You're super talented. You're super bright. And I want you to grow, you know. So that's been fun. I haven't had someone like that in a few years. I've had other people, but it's really been fun lately to work with him and try to get him excited about next steps. That's great. So you mentioned, you know, your your mentor, the former CEO, would kind of give you some honest feedback about, maybe mistakes you made. So can you share a, a leadership lesson that you maybe learned the hard way, something that, you know, maybe didn't go the way you expected and you learned from? 
Yeah, I, I think that, I don't know if I can give a, a completely specific example, but I think I have a tendency, and I have to catch myself, where I think I know what the answer is, but before we've had the discussion and the analysis and heard everybody's views, and that is, I think, a, can be a fatal flaw. You know, if you've decided on something before the group has come together and even had a chance to talk about it, you're going to end up in a, in a tough place. So the sitting back and listening is hard for me. I'm a talker if you haven't figured that out. And, and taking opposing views. And there have been many instances over the years where I've really come out of a meeting saying, wow, I'm so glad I didn't like go down my road because it wasn't the right answer. So being very careful to not jump to conclusions and weigh all the pieces. Um, sometimes we're just in such a hurry that we skip those important steps. Tell, talk a little bit about culture and, and, and what's, why is culture, organizational culture important? And what, is, uh, uh, what aspects of org organizational culture are particularly important to you and how do you try to nurture those in your organization? Mm -hmm. I think in a small hospital, loyalty and in a community hospital too. So, you know, small and community. So people who work here live here. It's really important to build a culture that values the staff. Not that it's so different in a large urban hospital, but I think it's a different feel for it. We, we have lower turnover because, again, some of it is people have chosen a life and a lifestyle, but also I think we're investing in that they're part of not just an organization, but a family. And I don't mean it to sound too squishy, but I think that's culture, but also important for stability in our future. So really a lot of work on retaining staff. Um, a lot of sharing of patient experience information, which really circles back directly to the care that's provided and people feeling proud of the work they do. So small example, if I get a note from a patient, you know, because my name is in their little book, to say how amazing their stay was, oh, I share that. I mean, that goes to everyone on their team. It gets read at staff meetings, things like that, that continually demonstrate the value of what they do. This week happens to be National Rehab Week. So, you know, we're having a barbecue and ice cream sundaes and all these little things, but they add up to telling staff that you value them and that they're important and that the work they do every single day is appreciated and valued. And I don't think you can minimize that kind of culture at all. Again, in a small community hospital, especially, it's important. That sounds, yeah, that sounds very important. Um, are, you, are you involved in professional organizations of any sort? I am. I am I'm very involved in AMRPA, which the, is the American Medical Rehab Providers Association. So our national organization, I go to the meetings, I'm, I'm on a couple of committees, and it, that's largely lobbying, advocacy, fighting for the work we do. And it's great. I have a lot of network friends through that. And also more recently, but through ACHE, the American College of Healthcare Executives, which I'm working on my fellow, which I probably should have done years ago, but it's funny how the years just go by, but I am yeah, actively yeah. working on that finally, right. um, which is great. And those are the two big ones. Two of the big ones, okay. Yeah, I am involved in, um, on the Cape, we have a community leadership institute where I sit on the board of that, which is helping to grow emerging leaders in our local community, not all healthcare, but from all walks of life, which is great. Great. So kind of staying with the theme of kind of self-improvement, uh, if you had to pick a book that early careerists who aspire to uh, senior leadership like, like, like a role like yours should read, what would, what would you recommend? I, you know, I thought about this one long and hard last night. I read a lot. Um, I picked Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, okay. You know, it really spoke to me as a woman executive and the struggle of balancing it all and the work, the family, trying to keep it in balance, and not being afraid to push ourselves as women leaders and saying, you know, I deserve my place at the table. And I enjoyed reading it. It was, a, a, I need to read her second book since her husband has passed away, and I haven't done that yet. But that one I found, um, it, was, it was a fun read, but I, it resonated with me. We have about, uh, in the undergraduate program where I primarily teach, we're about 90% females. So oh, okay. 
There you nice. go. <laughs> I also, uh, the five dysfunctions of a team, Patrick Lencino. Oh, I like that I one. I love Lencino. that one. Yes. It's so practical. Yeah. I'm a very pragmatic yeah. person and I love the checklists. <laughs> we did that as our yeah. management team. We read the book together and then we did the exercises together. It was fun. Uh, yeah. So kind of last question. Um, sure. So for a young person uh, thinking about a career in health, why, why rehab? Why go into the rehab field? Either as a as a clinician or as an administrator leader? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, job security. Uh, the baby boomers are aging. I miss it by one year, so I'm not one of them. Um, and there is always going to be a need for rehab. And it is a very exciting, cutting edge, fulfilling um, area of healthcare that allows you to have relationships with people. I mean, I, I think if you prefer not to talk to patients, you know, go work in the ER or the OR, but here you're going to know people. And it's really um, a very vibrant, exciting place. I think in terms of healthcare administration, too, there will always be good, well-paying jobs, and, and it could be in anything. That's what's cool about healthcare, is if you don't want to be on the patient side, there's human resources, there's finance, there's IT, there's marketing, there's so many cool aspects to healthcare that still, I feel you're serving the patients, you know, you're providing the background, the backbone to taking care of patients by being in one of those other areas as well. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate you know, it. I appreciate it. It was wonderful to talk to you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon. <laughs>